Please be seated. You take your Bible again this time, turn to Proverbs chapter 6. It is on page 530 in the Pew Bible. Continuing in Proverbs, uh, words of wisdom, moral clarity, Proverbs 6, the white sheet with the outline, the moral foundation, financial morality, interpersonal morality, sexual morality. Let's give our attention again to the reading and the hearing of God's word, Proverbs chapter 6. My son, if you put up security for your neighbor, have given your pledge to a stranger, if you're snared in the words of your mouth, caught in the words of your mouth, then do this, my son, save yourself, for you've come into the hand of your neighbor. Go, hasten, plead urgently with your neighbor, give your eyes no sleep, your eyelids no slumber. Give yourself, save yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the hand of the fowler. Go to the ant, O sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her bread in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. A worthless person, a wicked man, goes about with crooked speech, winks with his eyes, signals with his feet, points with his fingers, and with perverted heart devises evil, continually sowing discord. Therefore, calamity will come upon him suddenly. In a moment, he will be broken beyond all healing. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among his brothers. My son, keep your father's commandment, forsake not your mother's teaching, bind them on your heart always, tie them around your neck. When you walk, they will lead you. When you lie down, they will watch over you. When you awake, they will talk with you. For the commandment is a lamp, and the teaching a light, and the reproofs of discipline are the way of life, to preserve you from the evil woman, from the smooth tongue of the adulteress. Do not let her beauty in your heart, do not let her capture you with her eyelashes. For the price of a prostitute is only a loaf of bread, but a married woman hunts down a precious life. Can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned? Can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? So is he who goes in to his neighbor's wife. None who touches her will go unpunished. People do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy his appetite when he's hungry. But if he's caught, he'll pay sevenfold. He'll give all the goods of his house. He who commits adultery lacks sense. He who does it destroys himself. He'll get wounds and dishonor. His grace will not be wiped away, for jealousy makes a man furious, and he will not spare when he takes revenge. He will accept no compensation. He will refuse, though you multiply gifts. This is God's word for us. Let's pray. Again, Holy Spirit, we ask that you would take the reading and especially the preaching of your word to convict and convert us, to build us up and encourage us through faith in Jesus Christ, to whom is all glory and on whom we depend. Amen. Proverbs are wise sayings in the public domain. 
They come from various places, but they're there because they make good sense. And oh, here's an example. A penny saved is a penny earned. We know that one. And it's true. If you save the penny, you have it. If you earn it, you have it. So it's similar. And that's saying be careful about spending. Not spending has its advantages. You, don't have, you still have the money that you can use for something you might need more or better use. And you got one less thing to take care of. Just a thought. Uh, there is an, another saying, measure twice, cut, yeah, cut once. You cannot uncut a board. You cannot uncut a piece of fabric. Like the old joke says, I don't get it, I measured that three times, and it's still too short after I cut it. You, you, you can't just keep cutting it, it just gets shorter and shorter and shorter. Okay, no, bad joke, I didn't tell it right. Uh, I cut this board three times and it's still too short. That's the joke, okay. People who know these secular proverbs know how to use them. You take the example and you figure out how this applies to you. Does this work for me? Uh, saving is good. Sometimes, though, you need that thing more than you need to save. It's a timely thing. And to buy it now, it's like, well, a penny saves a penny earned, but this is something I need right now, and so you buy it. Or the other thing, my dad uh, sold real estate 40 years. Most of us sold with him. I sold with him. And we would get a property that's really hot, like a lot of people looking at it. My dad was not a pressure salesman. He had one guy said, Gib, why did you make me buy that? I said, I tried to encourage you to realize this. And so I would say, look, take all the time you need, but realize don't take any extra because it may not be there. And more than once I've had somebody come back and say, yeah, I think we'd like to buy this. I'd say, I tried to tell you there's already a purchase agreement on that. If this doesn't go through in the loan process, you might have another shot at it. So there's times. We interpret these proverbs. Basically, we interpret it this way. Uh, if they work for you, good. But we shouldn't take the Bible proverbs in the same way. It's not just pious advice for you to take or leave. It's still the word of God. This is part of uh, the proverbs. It's a different genre, a different kind. You, you'll know the Bible better if you understand what kind of literature it is. The Psalms, they're Psalms. And you understand that as you interpret them. We read a psalm together, Psalm 15, this morning. It goes with this passage. And of course, the, Old, the New Testament passage goes with this passage quite a bit, too. The law, you read one way. The Proverbs, another. But they're all the word of God. Important. Understand them. Interpret them. This is not just pious advice you can ignore. No, this is God's word. and You need to understand it and how to apply it. The first point I have here is the moral foundation. To properly understand these proverbs, you need to understand the moral foundation, which is this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You need to know who God is. Know your relationship to God. He is the creator of all things, the sustainer of all things. There is a God. He is not you, right? We and you know what? He's also shown his love to you in Christ. We approach the Lord through the Lord Jesus. And we approach boldly through the Lord Jesus. You need to understand the Proverbs to use them. Now here's an example. You can take a spanner or a crescent wrench, whatever you will call it. You know those wrenches that adjust? They're made to turn nuts and bolts. You can knock a nail into a board with one. It'll mar it up. And it may go in crooked, but it could be done. Don't do that. Go get a hammer. You understand what the hammer is for. You understand what the spanner is for. You can take a proverb and misuse it like that. And it may kind of work for you a little bit, but you'll be missing something. Again, God is the creator. God is the one you're responsible to and should be thankful to for all the things he gives. How does that understand your, affect your understanding of these proverbs? When you realize and you fear the Lord, you say, this is not just advice I can take or leave. This is God's word. 
I want to make sure I really understand it and apply it. You know, in the secular proverbs, you can say, well, I'll do what I want. I'll either do it or won't. And then how do you judge it? How things turned out? I guess it turned out okay. I guess I made the right choice. But I want to tell you something. Ben Franklin is long dead. You know, all these proverbs that we got from him, poor Richard's almanac. And even when he was alive, he, didn't, it, he wasn't personally offended if you didn't follow his word. This is God's word. Realize this is God's word. You need to take God's word as God's word. Not just say, well, maybe I'll do it and if things turn out okay, I guess I didn't have to do that. No. God's word has a long range effect. Maybe this will not work out for you this day as well as if you had not followed God's ways, but there's future things coming along. For example, Psalm 15 talks about the righteous man is not making a, a discord among others, as this passage will talk about too. There's another one that says he'll swear to his hurt and he doesn't repent. Well, I'm getting the old, the old version in my head. Uh, for example, back to real estate, you have a fair market, it's open, everybody's understanding. Real estate is a meeting of the minds. I want to buy it for this much. Well, that's not enough. I want to sell it for this much. That's too much. Well, they look at the market, they figure out, you know what, this is the thing. We will agree to this. And every, there's no duress. I'm coming back to my real estate days here. Uh, it's, it, what they would agree to, an informed buyer and an informed seller, not under duress, either one, would agree to. That's fair market value. Well, let's say they make the agreement. And as things go forward, all of a sudden, something drastically changed. Wait a minute, if I sell this now, I, I, I could get more money if I just yank it away. Well, no, you said you would. That was the meeting of the minds. Well, I, I, I could make more money this way if I don't do it this way. God's word says, do it what you said, because there's an advantage to that too. Yes, you could have made more money, but if you're one whose word is known, your word is trusted, that is really, that's gold. If you are somebody whose character is that way, people look at you and think, I can trust this person. Yeah, I'm going to say my dad, 40 years in real estate, uh, he was that kind of guy. And I got the blessing just because I had the same name. That was cool. So I wanted to be that kind of guy too. Plus you can realize that God's word has an eternal con consequence. Who may be with God? The person who does it God's way. Praise God, we have forgiveness. So, you need the right moral foundation. You need to realize that this is to show you how you apply the law, how you can do God's things God's way, how to live a better life. Second point here, this next section is about money. Verses 1 to 11, I guess. Two things that make people really nervous when they hear the preacher talk about. One is money. And the other is sex. I'm not sure which one they're more nervous about. And this passage has both. So you're welcome. Uh, the first is about money. And I tell you, if there are two things that our society really doesn't understand and really has wrong, it's money and sex. And as off as, as, off as the second one is, the one they really don't understand is money. You can't worship God and money. Okay, this begins with putting up security for someone else. This is a co-signing a loan. This is the way we would view it. A person needs a loan, but they don't have the credit for it. And they come to you and say, well, could you sign on and guarantee this loan? And you look at them and you, 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 you feel for them. Yeah, okay. And you look at their situation, well, if it was me, and I was the one doing this, I would be able to figure out how I'm going to work hard, I'm going to pay this off, and this person just helping me get the credit. And if it were you, maybe that's exactly what happened, and nothing would ever, they'd never be bothered again. But here's the problem. It's not you. Let's look at the verses again. My son, if you put up security for a neighbor, given your pledge for a stranger, if you're snared by the words of your mouth, Caught by the words of your mouth, and do this, my son, save yourself, for you've come into the hands of your neighbor. Hasten, 
plead urgently with your neighbor, give your eyes no sleep, your eyelids no slumber, save yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the hand of the fowler. Now, if you've agreed to this, you've given your word. But there are situations, today anyway, where if you've co-signed something, you've done that because they don't trust the other person's credit. After a year or so, they may look and say, you know, they're pretty faithful. I guess, yeah, we can let you off of this. It can be done. But the scripture is saying, saying don't be doing this. Don't co-sign. Um, why do you do it? Well, you feel for them, right? But the reason that they need this and don't have the credit may not be just because they had bad fortune. It may be because of bad decisions. And if they still have those bad decisions, they're going to default on this too. And you're going to go down too. You're not in control of what they do. Do you have the money to cover this debt? Well, why aren't you lending them the money? Or if you have enough, why don't you just give it to them? I don't have that kind of money. Well, think about this then. Sometimes what someone needs is not what they're scheming or planning. I shouldn't use the word scheming. That's very negative. They maybe need to really change. People don't like to change. I had a friend back in, well, he was from Tennessee, but he would say, John, people change. People, but seldom. I said, Bill, we're working in the church of Jesus. We believe in change. Right? And people do change in Christ. But inspect the fruit. You need, if you bail someone out, you might just be entrenching them in the bad patterns that got them into that place in the first time. There's a book called When Helping Hurts, written by our friends down in Chattanooga. And it talks about where you can create dependency. You don't want to do that. But he does want us to have mercy. Mercy on those who need it. And not <clears throat> enslavement. Well, the second part of this section deals with encouragement to hard work. And this could be given to the person who wants the loan. This could be given to everybody. You need to work hard. You want to succeed? Do that which is successful. I heard a... Uh, a speech given by Roger Federer. He was one of the greatest tennis players. Though you follow tennis, might recognize his name. And he was saying, you have talent, of course, very talented. He says, but so are the rest of them. You have to work very hard doing the things that will make it better. He said, I won 54% of all the points in my tournaments. Just over half. And he still won. How did he do that? He worked very hard, and he had talent and kept at it, worked hard every day, day in, day out, because those other guys are really good too. But he did say this, of the two, talent and faithful hard work. The hard work is the thing that's going to make you a winner. It's going to give you success. Now, if you're familiar with the music of Judy Rogers, these are going to be very familiar verses. I've been whistling this tune all day. Verse 6. Go to the ant, O sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her bread in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. Ants are amazing. They, they do what the colony needs to survive. I saw something where ants will even go to other ants who've been injured to do surgery on them and help them out. And they'll sacrifice themselves for the others. And they are unstoppable. Have you ever had ants in your house? <laughs> How do you keep these out? Clove oil, a cinnamon. They hate cinnamon. It just, it's, it's too strong a smell. It confuses them. I love cinnamon. <laughs> ants, though, they, they keep at it. They keep at it all the time. And what do they do? They, they, they don't have anyone telling them what to do. They don't have a boss looking over their shoulder. I don't think they have shoulders, right? They just do what they do. That's how God made them. And then there's this, the fable you know about the ant and the grasshopper. The grasshopper spends the sun, summer hopping on grass. And the ant's like busy working, busy working. The grasshopper's saying, ha ha, you're busy working. And I'm hopping on grass. And then comes the end of the time when there's no food left and the grasshopper has nothing. And the ant says, well, we've been working all summer. 
because you make hay while the sun shines, right? You have to strike while the iron's hot. You have to do while you can. Good advice, good financial advice. Do the job that you need to do when you need to do it. And if you don't, you'll find yourself in financial straits. Verse 9, how long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you rise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding the hands of rest. And poverty comes on you like a bandit, right? Like a robber, like an armed man. There's something more here, though. It's not just work hard. They say all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. But as one guy said, yeah, all work and no play makes Jack. <laughs> do what needs to be done, but realize that we're created to do things. In the beginning, Genesis 1, God tells Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, uh, birds of the heavens and every living thing that moves on the earth. This is called the cultural mandate. Everything that we do as human beings in culture, whether it's making music, making buildings, uh, making associations, uh, making farming, and, and all the things that we do, that's all part of the cultural mandate. God made us to do this and told us to do this. We're not idle. Adam and Eve, they weren't idle in the garden. They named animals. You know, they looked after things. I must admit, to just pull the fruit right off the tree is not very hard. It's kind of nice, but it was sin that made things more difficult. Whatever you do, whether you eat, whether you drink, do all to the glory of God. By the way, you can play a game to the glory of God. Interpersonal morality, third point we've got here, how do you treat other people? You know, if you treat people well, they treat you well, generally. Not everybody, but generally. Uh, most of the time, though, people will treat you well hoping to get something from you. And you watch out for that. Uh, a person who changes the way he acts in order to manipulate, maybe deceive, to get what he wants. God has a name for that. Verse 12, a worthless person, a wicked man, goes about with crooked speech, winks with his eyes, signals with his feet, points with his fingers, crosses his fingers behind his back, uh, knocks on whatever he's got that's going to be not telling the truth, and that's his excuse for not telling the truth and being plain. Verse 14, with a perverted heart, he, he devises evil, continually sowing discord. Rile people up. If you rile people up, you can, you can get an advantage. You ever see the musical, The Music Man? We got to rile people up. There's a, there's a pool hall right here in River City. That's the trouble with a capital T that rhymes with P, and that stands for pool. That's the, he just made that up. Turned out to be the mayor's pool hall. Hmm. Anyway, people will do that. It does say calamity will come upon him. Can you, can you make a profit by stirring up people? Absolutely. What do you think social media is these days? It's people stirring up people and making people mad. And these people spin this and give it to these people in that silo. You've heard that, right? These people take this, spin it this way, and give it to them in that silo. And they're all outraged. And they look at the others thinking, what's wrong with them? They're wicked. What's wrong with them? They're crazy. Something's wrong. We've got to do something. Oh, my, something's going on. Now, look. Know what the news is. Know what's going on. Pray to the Lord. Take appropriate action. We're called to do these things. But don't marinate in the spin and just get yourself all riled for no reason except you're riled. Because the reason they're getting you riled is because they got eyeballs on there and they're making money from you. There's money to be had. There's power to be gained by getting people divided against each other. We just had a holiday on Thursday, right? Independence Day. That's a day where we are thankful that God gave us this country. And they say 250 years is about the end of a society like this. 
Now, by God's grace, maybe not. By the power of God's people, maybe not. But realize it's not there forever. Do not take advantage or do not take for granted the blessings of God. And there are many. And the blessings that we pay, pray for, as Paul says to Timothy in Timothy chapter 1, is that we would have peace and be able to preach the word of God and to draw people to Christ. And that's my mission. And that's our mission. And I'm here to encourage you in Jesus. Be encouraged. Oh my. Things that God hates. How should we talk? Don't be that corrupt guy. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as good for building others up according to their needs, that it might be filled with grace. That's from Ephesians. What a wonderful book. Next four verses tell kind of things that God hates. And if these describe your interpersonal relations, God hates it. It's destructive. Think about them. Examine your own heart. When you see these things here in your heart, repent. We see them in others. Beware. Verse 16, there are six things the Lord hates, seven that are abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, false witnesses who breathe out lies, one who soars, sows discord among the brothers. It's good to know these, to remember these, place them in your heart, think on these things. These are seven awful things. Now, God is love. We know this is true. But there are things God hates that we should hate too, like proud looking eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that thinks of wicked things to do, and feet that run to evil too. And anyone who wants to lie about others, the one who sword sows trouble with his brothers. Okay, I'm quoting song lyrics again. Seriously, if you don't know Judy Rogers' music, uh, it is wonderful. These that were written for children, and you give these to children, and they are something that stays with them. When you give them to older children, like in their 30s, they'll stay with them too. Uh, Judy, if, if she's, well, Wayne's the pastor up at Dickinson First. She grew up in that church. And this has been around for 30 years or more. Let's teach our children while their hearts are tender. Parents, grandparents. Okay, number four, sexual mor morality. I'm not going to spend as long on this because we're looking at chapter seven next week. And that's all about this too. But it deals with it in a rather dramatic way, in fact. But the first thing is this. Sexual purity is part of the parent's urging. Part of God's word, but the real urging here. Because there is a urging, a siren call to all sorts of immorality. It's all around us. It's unavoidable. You hear it. That woman folly. You might remember in chapter 9, it was Lady Wisdom who's calling out but Folly's calling out too. And she can be loud, these siren songs. And those in chapter 9, they get seduced and they don't realize that's the way of death. That's what this is talking about too. Verse 20. My son, keep your father's commandment. Forsake not your mother's teaching. Bind them on your heart always. Tie them around your neck. When you walk, they will lead you. When you lie down, they'll watch over you. When you wake, they'll talk to you. This is true of God's word. Keep it there. Think about it. Meditate on these things. This is God's word. They're going to keep you on the right path. 23, the commandment is a lamp, the teaching a light, the reproofs of discipline, a way of life to preserve you from the evil woman, the smooth tongue of the adulteress. Keep your mind focused on the good commandments and the good things, and don't be lured away. And it's not just enough to say no to sinful, sinful temptations. Again, Nancy Reagan had her uh, about drugs, just say no. Well, that's, that's good. 
It's not enough. Why not? Because you need something to say yes to. It's not just say no. You need something to say yes to. Say yes to the word of God. Say yes to the delight of Christ. Look at the beauty that God has given you. Verse 25, do not desire her beauty in your heart. Do not let her capture you with her eyelashes. For the price of a prostitute is only a loaf of bread. And that's not good either. But here, you're breaking into a covenant. A married woman hunts down a precious life. All sexual temptations need to be fled from. But this one is the seventh commandment, which you've heard. You shall not commit adultery. If a man has relations with a married woman, he's committing adultery. If a woman has a relationship with a married man, she's committed adultery. And people will tell you, well, I, it's, not, it's nothing to me. I wasn't, I'm not married. It doesn't matter. You're breaking into a covenant that God recognizes and the state recognizes. Do you know that when a man and a woman get married in the Commonwealth of Virginia, they take that and they record it at the courthouse? Of course you knew that. What does that mean? That means that the country and society recognizes this union, this covenantal union. You got no business getting inside of that. That's for them. You realize this. And I know that this is for the man to avoid the temptress. And that's quite a bit. And the next chapter looks at that too. It does work the other way too. A woman sh should not get in, have, break her own covenant or someone else's. I mean, what does the scripture say? En enjoy the wife of your youth. It's a wonderful thing. Because I'm not an old guy. When I say I'm an old guy, I'm not, I'm, I don't really believe it. I'm, I'm young. And I'm not letting the old guy in. And you all feel that way, don't you? It doesn't matter how old you get. Oh, sometimes I feel it. Okay. And my dear wife, she's the same age as I am. Now, the fact is, she looks like she did 45 years ago, but... And I'm not so much. Oh, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. And I mentioned Charlotte uh, and Claude uh, Cumbo. And her comment was, y'all are just babies. We got married the year you were born. <laughs> There's some marriages here that have gone on for more than 50 years. And I tell you, that is precious. Precious. Metaphors here are striking. You need to run away. Like Joseph, when Joseph was grabbed by Potiphar's wife, he ran away. He fled and he got in trouble because she lied about him and who are you going to believe, him or her? He's the servant. She's the lady of the house. And he spent 14 years in prison because of that. That was a better deal. Turns out that was actually perfect because when the Lord needed Pharaoh to know who Joseph was and where Joseph was, he was there waiting. And in the 14 years, he did not give his heart over to bitterness, but continued to trust the Lord. And God used that. Now, you can only know that by trusting the Lord. Would you see that ahead? 14 years in jail, that doesn't sound so good. Well, it brought about salvation for the people of Israel, the children of Israel, and for everybody in the empire, everybody in Egypt. Striking metaphors here. Verse 27, can a married man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned? No. Can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? I'm not going to try that. So is he who goes to his neighbor's wife None who touches her will go unpunished. People do not despise the thief if he steals to satisfy his appetite when he's hungry. We understand that. 
right? Le, Les Miserables, Jean Valjean steals a loaf of bread because he's hungry. Well, Scripture says if he's caught, he'll pay back sevenfold. That's the way they did. They didn't throw him in jail. People understand if you're starving that you need to eat. But, verse 32, he who commits adultery lacks sense. He who does it destroys himself. He gets wounds and dishonor. His disgrace will not be wiped away. For a jealous man, jealousy makes a man furious. He will not spare when he takes revenge. He will accept no compensation. He will refuse, though you multiply gifts. There's an offense you can't undo. You can't unsay what you've said. If you steal something, you can return it or replace it. Realize that. But also please realize this. In Christ there's forgiveness. In Christ there's forgiveness. For, the, for even any of these Ten Commandments. For all of them. We are given God's grace. Not that we would sin more. But that we would, by God's spirit, live unto him. Praise the Lord. I'm going to close by rereading part of our New Testament passage. Verse 16 there, it says, I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Deliberately walk in the ways of the Lord. Let the Spirit lead you with joy, and you'll be pondering the path of your feet, and the light of the Word will be on your way, and you will be protected from these things. The desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. The desires of the Spirit against the flesh, they're opposed to each other. You know, they keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. The works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, and strife. Well, we're back to that now, are we? Jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, things like these. I warned you, as I warned you before, those who do such things do not inherit the kingdom of God. Be liberated from those things. And your, your footnote, if you saw that when Eric was reading, it's, 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 this is your practice. Has you, what happens if you do it? Well, then you repent and you're forgiven. And God gives you the ability to stop, draw you from it. But what if you do it again? Then you repent and you're forgiven. But this is not who you are anymore. You don't see yourself this way anymore. The works of the sinful flesh are clear and obvious. What's the life in the spirit look like? The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such the, the law, it doesn't matter. There's no law against them. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Amen. Let's pray. O Holy Father, through whom all good proceeds, let these Christian graces, faith, hope, love, and all of the fruit of the Spirit, be established in me and grow every day. May the precious fruit of your spirit be increasing in my life. That I could flee the temptations, recognize them, and flee them as they're foolish. Dear Lord, I believe that you rule all things in wisdom and in righteousness. You've called me to be your child, your servant. And you rightly demand that I would serve you in your will. And in Christ Jesus, you've shown me a way of salvation where I can be delivered from all my sins. And that when I truly repent, you pardon me. You save me. You rescue me. Oh God, I pray daily for your mercies to continue for me. For sin's hold on my will to become less and less and my growth in grace and true holiness increase day to day. Lord, give me a more perfect holiness. So when my days here are done, on that day I'll know even as I am known. Help me to walk with unwavering faith. 
through Christ Jesus, my Lord. Amen.